Well, good evening again, Saints. Um, got a little bit new equipment here, so I'm trusting everything is going to come out well. Brother Nate Littlejohn has done a great job of trying to educate this old preacher to how to handle technology. And so with God's help and his guidance and your prayers, hopefully this comes across fine. We're going to be looking this evening again at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the last two verses, verses 39 through 40. And uh, again, this is a chapter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the saints who had questions. As a matter of fact, there are questions throughout the whole book of Corinth. But this particular one is, has to do with relationships, whether married, uh, whether single, uh, whether widowed, uh, whether somebody was a virgin, whether somebody was divorced. Basically, all of the things that we uh, people may have questions about today in their various statuses or stations that they're presently in or what they'd like to change someday. So the word of God does have guidance and instructions. It does not leave us to flunder. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 7, but we're going to pray. You get your Bibles and we're getting 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Father, we thank you for this time to be with the saints once again. Bless the speaking and dividing and understanding that goes from the teacher to the hearer to the heart that we might do and live by the principles that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word that gives us guidance so that we don't have to wander through the dark trying to find our way. You've given us good light, and your word is a light and a lamp to our feet. It's in Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 7, and the last two verses, 39 through 40, the Bible says the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgments. And I think also that I have the spirit of God. Now this will be a second time around that the apostle Paul comes back and mentions widows. You'll find this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, in verse 8, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows. But here he highlights the widows along as he closes the book. Now, remember, the original question was, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Meaning, is it the, the, the celibate state? Is that the more spiritual and desirable state? And he, he says, yes, it is for the person who uh, desires it and also who is gifted for it. But it's not for everybody. He goes through here to show us uh, that if you're going to be someone who's living a celibate life and it is commendable, it's good, uh, that this person also cannot be involved in acts such as fornication. You can't live celibate and then try to live like you're married with somebody and you're unmarried. He said, uh uh, that's absolutely out because your body belongs to the Lord and you're to glorify God in the body and in his spirit, which belongs to him. And secondly, if you are married, the celibate state is not even, it's not there. It's not to be discussed. And the reason being is the reason for marriage is that you have duties and obligations, both the woman and the man, each to the other. And so had the person wanted to remain celibate, they probably should have never gotten married. And if you are married, you can't move into a celibate state. And he only gives one reason why you can do this. And he puts real big fences up. He says, spiritually, if you're going to fast and you agree to this, first of all, there's an agreement. It's not just one says I'm doing this. You both agree. Then you do what you're going to do. You fast and you pray. And then he says, the other fence is come back together again because you're trying to close the gate where Satan can work on and tempted us. Not that we can't be tempted, but Satan will certainly tempt us to go and do things that maybe we shouldn't do because we have a person that we're trying to live with who's trying to be celibate and that's not you, what you or what that person, what I would want to be in a marriage relationship. Again, had I wanted that, I would have stayed single. And so he's encouraging them to deal with these areas. They seem maybe not to be the spiritual things that you would think about, about praying and all of that, but it, ought to, it is the issues of life. He talks about the unmarried and widows in verse eight, as I mentioned. And I think that unmarried has a lot in it because this would be someone who is not married, 
but also could have a lot of group people who've never been married but they have experience sexually someone who's never been married they have children someone who's been married and they're divorced someone who's been married divorced and have children I think that group that word unmarried catches all that group and if you stop and think if you look around our world that's pretty much descriptive a lot of people have been active a lot of us were active sexually before we married some have children out of that some uh, don't have children some have been married and divorced that catches just about everybody and he saves the widows and widows but he, he kind of deals with them a little bit different at the end of chapter 7 verses 39 through 40 and so again he is giving some answers to questions that had been written to him and uh, so now he's, he's talking to now just uh, the, the widows. Uh, notice in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, he says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband uh, liveth. This is not the only place this particular principle finds its mark. This really is birthed out of Genesis chapter 2. When the woman and man first met, God made the woman from the man, brought him to the man, and he called her woman, and he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Later on, when Jesus referred to this in Matthew chapter 19, he referred the apostles to that particular passage of scripture, bone of my bone, and then he says, what therefore God have joined together, let not man put asunder. And so he's pushing the idea very strongly that a man and a woman come together in a committed relationship before the Lord and they live that way until they die. What God has put together, let not man put asunder. He repeats this statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you would. He says uh, in uh, verse 10, and unto the merit, he's talking to believers, Christian people, I command, not a suggestion. He says, not yet not I, but the Lord let not the wife depart from her husband. So he puts these big fences up for married people that they don't depart, they stay together, they do what they vow to do until death do them part. Good times, bad times, challenging times, all of that has to be there. But the belief is that a person who's in Christ, two people who have the Holy Spirit in them will know how with the wisdom of God and the help of the Holy Spirit know how to so live with each other that they don't just endure the marriage but they enjoy it so that's factored in that god is expecting that of his people he gives instructions to how they can do that husbands and wives the book of ephesians other places you're going to find instructions on how to get that done so basically i tell people before you marry read the blueprints read the uh, guidelines read what god has factored that should be in the relationship and then commit yourself to those and you're going to be just fine. Now, he says to those people who are married, you stay together until death do you part. Look in Romans, if you would, please. Uh, the book of Romans, chapter seven. I believe that's where I want to go. Yes, Romans seven. And uh, looking at verses one to verse four. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which have an husband is bound by the law uh, to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, that's the point, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. Romans is pushing a good principle, strong principle. Earlier. He talks about how that a Christian now has a relationship as a master to a servant. And then he says, no man can serve two masters. And so once you become a Christian, 
You're no longer a servant to the flesh. You're no longer a servant to the devil. You're no longer a servant to the world. Your new master in your new relationship with Christ Jesus would cause you to be obedient to him. Here in Romans 7, not only do you have a new master, but you actually have a new relationship by marriage. Interesting. Because he says now, as long as you were as you were when you were first born, you were married and attached to the law. But he says, no longer are you done, are you attached to the law? It's interesting, not that the law was bad, not that the law died, but he says, believer, you died to the law so that you could be married to another. The person that we're married to in relationship is Jesus Christ by grace. And that could not have been if we were married to the law and Christ, which is a very strong argument to prove that you have the law cannot do what a relationship with Jesus can do. It cannot be law and grace. It has to be grace alone. So we have a new relationship and he pictures this by using the illustration of a marriage of a, a woman who's married to a man. But when he dies, she can be married to another person. Now, again, the principle in Romans is a little different because it says we die. And now that we're dead, the, the law didn't die. We died to the law so that we can be married to another person. But he's emphasizing it, that what breaks the union between the, the woman and the man is death. And that is exactly what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians concerning the widow. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he said, now if the husband be dead, 1 Corinthians the 7th chapter, if she's dead, she is at liberty. Now, <clears throat> there are real sorrows in this world, very hard sorrows. Most of them I've experienced, but there are some I don't have. I know what it is to lose siblings, uh, sisters and brothers, um, several. There were 12 of us in the family. And so that first one who died, first sibling, uh, that really hit us hard because we had not had a death. And we, it, it isn't that the others have been different. We just understood we were not unique, that death could visit our family as well. I know the experience of losing a loved one uh, that close. My wife and I, although we have not talked about it a lot, uh, she lost a, a baby uh, during pregnancy. And so she wasn't very far along, but the grief for us was still just as real as though that baby was born. We'd already picked out a name. <laughs> While I have five boys, I have secretly told myself that was probably our girl. We, I know what it is to put a father in the grave and attend to his ceremony. As a matter of fact, even preach his funeral because he would, he, he made me declare that I would do his service. It was not what I wanted to do. I also know what it is to do the same for a mom. Um, but the experience of losing a child, uh, a, a grown child, and the experience of losing a spouse, I don't have. But after over 40 plus years of being a pastor, I've seen all of the dynamics of the grief stages and what happens. It's uh, particularly when a person loses a spouse and they have been in a model and a good relationship whether it be a short time, a long period of time, they love each other. When a death takes place, there's a hole for that survivor. It is a hole that is very deep. And the future has a bleakness to it. They just don't see how life is going to continue. Most of us have some emotions like that about death, but this one is particularly hurt because you're talking about the person that you have bonded with You've built a life with, and if it's been a number of years, uh, I, even a short marriage, it can hurt just as much. I don't know that feeling, but I've witnessed it. And generally, right after a death of a spouse, we struggle, at least I do as a pastor, of trying to get his, the scriptures into the person who's surviving so they understand that death is common to all men, and us being married and us being Christians was not going to stop that. But you're struggling to keep that person uh, in their faith, trust in the Lord, even when they cannot get a hold of what's going on emotionally. It's a struggle. You won't tell them, you don't want to use the wrong language. 
you want to use biblical language, language that explains and helps them to see uh, that God has not left them alone. But the person has. And so they have to adjust to um, a home. If there are no children to being alone, they have to adjust to an empty bed. They have to adjust to a table uh, with just one plate. I haven't been there. But I have witnessed and questioned and talked to people who have. And that doesn't go away in a day or a night. It's not wise for us to just keep saying to them it's going to be all right after a while. Everybody has to work through their own grief process differently. But I have witnessed in our, my ministry over 40 years of people losing a spouse and then finding someone else they want to marry. Now, some would say, well, that's the second marriage. That It doesn't make it a second marriage dairy mass marriage is just that they're now free to live and love again. Now that is not saying they didn't love the person they were married to at first. As a matter of fact, if you are, if you think about it and I've asked people these questions, how do you adjust in your relationship to marriage where one or both of you are survivors? And I've gotten some sage and some great advice for people who I've counsel who've been through that and they have to recognize hey <laughs> your spouse might call you by the previous spouse's name can you handle that uh, it's not that they mean to be mean it's just that 35 40 years of calling the same name and interestingly I've, I've had couples they laugh about it when it happens but you have to be prepared to understand that a second marriage that's what he's saying is not a secondary it's just a second and it is because the relationship with the first person has been broken. And uh, again, each person is different and they're going to be different of how they come at this. But I would say to the person who is maybe uh, in a situation where you've lost someone. Number one, don't rush into anything. I advise that even if you've never been married before. Number two, if you're ever considering remarrying, as a believer, you only have one option. It should be with another believer. That's why he says at the end of the verse, he says, you're free to be married to whom you will. She is. But he says only in the Lord and in the Lord, an unbeliever tied to a believer is unequally yoked. And so that consideration has to be there that the person you're considering needs to be somebody who's on one accord spiritually uh, as you are. And you want to not only walk wisely, carefully in these situations, give yourself the appropriate time. And I must tell you, I have no way of telling you what that time frame is. It, it, it's not something you could say you have to wait this long before. That is nothing that the Bible tells us. As a matter of fact, it is wrong for us to tell people what a time frame is. The Bible just does not give that. It gives the principle that when the person is dead, the one who is surviving is at liberty. Now, obviously, wisdom would say there's a grief process and that differs for a lot of people. But I have asked people, what was the turning point? I've asked couples who have married and they found love again. What was the turning point that you knew you were prepared and ready? And I would suggest that if you're in that state, talk to someone. I can give you what they said, but you're going to find some folks who've been in this. They can give you what they looked at and what they thought about, but they use wisdom. As a pastor, I've had two people across from this desk. And uh, as I was trying to counsel both this man and this woman, and they were both surviving spouses, oh my, I felt so inadequate. Number one, both of them were a little bit older than I was. I won't say quite a bit, but a little bit. And I thought I should be getting more advice from them about marriage, but they wanted the counseling. And I do believe that that's one thing you should do, regardless to how old you are and how long you were married. I still think you need to get good counsel from somebody. They chose to do that. And I have never, I've told them both, I cannot tell you how much fun it was to work with them through the counseling process knowing that I was dealing with two very mature people 
who had common interests in the Lord and they were not 20 or 25 year old kids who did not know what they wanted to do. It was so much more fun. And even to this day, I can tell you they're celebrating 11 years and they, they said they still called each other to this day, the, the other previous spouse's name, and they don't stress about it because they're not dishonoring the memory. They love somebody, but they also love another person. And you know what? God allows that here according to the word of God. And so I would give counsel if I were to tell someone this is not something immediately after the loss of a loved one. I've had a lot of people say that I will never love anybody ever, ever again. And I don't try to correct them. I know they probably mean it when they say it. But I've also seen that over time, the circumstances change, the person change. And if God brings the right person into that person's life, there's no sin. Now, if they choose to stay celibate and single, he said it's not a sin. He said, I wish everybody can do what I'm doing. But it will not be for everybody, and it will not be for all time. Now, don't just find somebody. I'll say this if you're single, if you're divorced, or if you're widowed. There is something worse than not being married, if I could say worse, more challenging. And that challenge is being married to the wrong person. That is why that phrase, in the Lord, is so very, very important. And so I want to help people. I don't know what it means to, to lose a spouse. I think I know most emotions. That's one of them I haven't had. I trust that God will give me grace to outlive my, my wife. But if he doesn't, I'm going to depend on him for the grace and wisdom to know what to do if that day ever comes. But once the death takes place, the relationship on earth is broken. And there is no such thing as I will be married to that person in heaven. It doesn't work that way. That's not what the scripture teaches. And so we're talking about relationships on earth. Now, you do know you're never going to please everybody all the time. You do know that. You may not please everybody some of the time. But if you're considering this, be sure that whatever choices you make are going to be pleasing to the Lord. And if it pleases the Lord then I think the relationship, such a relationship, is on good footings to be successful and happy. And again, I have great stories of people who are surviving spouses who have found unique and wonderful relationships. The partner they're married to is different, except that. Uh, the taste and, this, and likes about the persons are different, but they found they could love again. And I think you'll find people just like that that might serve as an encouragement. Now, again, this is not a, what's the word? This is not a push for any man or woman to go and do something. This is just the Apostle Paul saying, if you have this situation, and if you have this situation, if you have this situation, this is what God permits and allows. And so as long as we're following his guidelines, we're going to be on good ground. I trust that you'll read this whole chapter and find that God had answers to the questions and the unique situations we find in life. Celibate, he's got some, he got some information. Married, he got information. Divorced, he's got information. Deaf, he has information. And I believe if we avail ourselves of his information, it will help us. All right, that's what I have for you tonight. And I pray that God will help us to walk like he wants us to walk in all the relationships and situations that he brings us into, including. I have a pastor in Bahamas. His wife died from cancer. He is remarried now. Five years he waited. Didn't have to wait that long, but he did. And I've watched him and her flourish because he waited for the right one. So again, I've seen this. I have ladies that I know. They remarried. Didn't have to wait as long as they did, but they did. And God brought the right person along. What I'm saying is, when we follow his blueprint, it'll take us to the destination that he wants us to be in, which is uh, obedient and a contentful place. God bless you. We'll see you again next week. Lord, bless the time to talk to the saints. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See ya.